Hey, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, we're going to be looking at a story in, uh, in the Gospels about Jesus, about his power. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one in the seats around you. Parents, help your kids find uh, Luke 17. Or kids, help your parents. <laughs> Uh, if, you're, if you're using one of the Bibles in the seats, then it is page 1041, so you'll find Luke 17 there. And by the way, if you need a Bible, you want to read God's Word and you don't have one, then take one of those home with you. That's our gift to you. Uh, now, this is uh, our very first uh, family weekend here at Sweetwater, so I hope you're enjoying that. And uh, I, I'm praying that uh, nobody was harmed by the t-shirt assault that began the service <laughs> off. And, and all. But kids, it is great having you in here, so I want you to follow along in your Bibles with us. Uh, now, the story we're going to read is about Jesus and some men who were uh, sick with a disease called leprosy. And leprosy was a really scary disease in uh, the time of Jesus. Because if you got leprosy, they, uh, they basically made you live apart from everybody else. You couldn't live with your family. You couldn't live uh, in the, the town you lived in. They actually made you move outside the, the city, and you had to live off by yourself. Eventually, they, the uh, lepers got together and formed leper colonies. But these people were outcasts. And the reason was that leprosy was a really scary disease. Now, we can easily treat it, so it's not scary today uh, because of the medicines that we have. But what would happen is your, your nerves in the, the extremities would stop feeling things, and so you'd hurt yourself, and you wouldn't know it, and then that would get infected, and then it would begin to rot off and fall off, so you'd get deformed. So this is what some pictures of leprosy look like. Parents, if your kids are squeamish, you may want to cover their eyes a little bit. Uh, but Miss Julie picked the pictures. She wouldn't let me put the really They're scary not that ones bad. up there. So these are some hands that some people have leprosy. You begin to see that. And this next one's a little more intense. It's just a face of somebody who, uh, who has leprosy. And, and so, like I said, it was a very frightening disease, not just because of what it did to you, but because you had to live away from everybody else. You were all alone. You were an outcast. So here we are, Luke 17, beginning in verse 11. It says, Now on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Ah, my page got stuck. Has that ever happened to anybody else? Aww. It won't turn at all. There we go. Have mercy on us. Now, they were standing at a distance because they weren't allowed to get close to people. They couldn't even be in a room like this, but if they were outside, they'd have to stay away from everybody. And yell from a distance. So they're yelling to Jesus, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. Now just pause right there. Jesus told them to go th show themselves to the priests because the priests were the ones who could give them the clean bill of health so they could move back in with their family and in their village. They couldn't go home until the priest said they were cured of leprosy. And that process actually took two weeks to happen. So they would go and show themselves to the priest and say, I'm cured of leprosy. And the priest would say, okay, come back and show yourself to me again uh, at a later date. And then I'll let you go home to your family and go home to your village. So the, Jesus said, go and do the legal requirements so that you can go home. So you can return to your normal life. So go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. Again, Samaritans and Jews didn't get along. Samaritans were the bad guys to the Jews, uh, and uh, they didn't even worship the same God. So he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed of leprosy? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now this is a great story. It's just uh, tremendous because of what Jesus does in the life of these men. And, and there's some things we want all of us to learn from the story. The first thing is this. Jesus cares for you. When you hear those words, is it hard for you to believe? For some of us, it's like, no, of course Jesus cares for me. And for other, others of us, it's hard to believe. Let me explain. We are all human, and we're surrounded by other humans that can actually be very cruel, mean. Some can call us names. Some can put us down, tell us we're not good enough. 
and some of us start to believe that. Raise your hand if you have ever been called a name that's not your name. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have ever been made fun of for something. Me too. You're raising your hand? Yeah. No one would ever make fun of you, Pastor oh, Chad. Yeah, yeah. Okay, first of all, I wear glasses, and I started wearing glasses as a kid, so what do you think they called me? Four eyes. Four eyes, yeah. Some of the others of you grew up with glasses, too. And, uh, but the one that was really cruel was uh, uh, about my teeth. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, I, I got tetra tetracycline given to me when I was a baby, and so that destroyed the enamel for my permanent teeth, and my teeth are discolored. And so when I was growing up with kids, they called me black teeth and made fun about, oh, you don't brush your teeth and things like that. So that Aww. one's kind of, yeah. You don't know anything about Are you about, okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine now. Okay. But, you know, actually right now I'm just thankful that I have teeth because I wasn't supposed, they weren't supposed to last this long. Yeah. So I'm praising God for that. Yeah, I don't care good. what color You can eat your are. ice cream and all your yeah, food. Yeah, But right. you could eat ice cream without them, yeah, I suppose. Without teeth, ice cream so you got still, that going. still food. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Julie? Yeah, you actually speaking of, of teeth, that brings back something. When I was in first and second grade, I went through a very awkward stage. Just then? Oh, well, actually <laughs> I'm still going through an awkward stage, but it was really extra awkward in first and second grade because I had lost all my baby teeth. And I had two very large chiclet teeth coming in on the very front, right about in that area. And um, they were very prominent. So kids would call me Bucky the Beaver. And some of you are laughing. It's not nice. Whenever I tell my children this story, they just can't handle it. They actually cried the first time I told them. Like, they can't make fun of you. That's how I feel when children make fun of my children. But people are mean, kids and adults alike. And when we start taking that to heart and believing, it's like, how could anybody care about me? But that's not true. If you look in this story, Jesus cared for the outcasts. He cared for the literally rotten, smelly, nasty, sick, dirty people that society didn't even want to be near. And if he loved them and cared for them, he definitely cares for you and for me. See, Jesus cares for me. That, that's those powerful words, especially um, uh, given my, my upbringing. Uh, I moved a lot as a child. Uh, I actually lived in 15 different houses the first 18 years of my life. And so uh, uh, I was the new kid always. And as a new kid and as somebody who, you guys notice this, I kind of like people. And uh, I'm an extreme extrovert, and so I like being with people, and I want to hang out with people. And so I was a new kid, and I was awkward. Um, Why still, did you point to me when you said that? I was relating to you. Okay. Mine didn't just last first <laughs> and second grade, though. Mine lasted all the time. And, and so I was awkward, so I tried too hard. And I was always the outcast. I was always the one who wanted to fit in and didn't. And so uh, for me, it's very important that Jesus cares for me. And I want Calvary to be a place where everybody who comes here understands that they are wanted and that they are welcome. I want us to be the church that embraces people no matter where they are, because I don't want anyone to be left out. That's why we want everyone to be in a life group or a Bible study or, or a group they can connect with so that you can have people who share your life and you know that you belong and are valued because Jesus cares for you. And, and I want us to be that church that just embraces anyone who comes in, not just with the greeters as they're me met at the door. We have great First Impressions team that does that. But I want everyone to make people feel welcome. And, and some of you have, have noticed that uh, since we moved to Sweetwater, you know, the kids go to their classes right away, and we don't have children's time in the service. And because we don't have children's time in the service, there's no natural place for us to do the stand and greet kind of time. And, uh, and some of you have asked, why can't we still have that? And uh, one reason is because it doesn't really fit without us having the kids uh, to, to have that awkward transition time when we did it. But the other reason that we stopped doing the stand and greet time is because as we read survey after survey and research that is done with people who attend church and especially guests, we found out that the vast majority of both members and guests despise the forced greeting time, the stand and greet time. So I thought I'd just do a little survey real quickly uh, right here uh, with you. And I want to know how many of you absolutely love and adore the stand and greet time that we made you guys do a little while ago. Okay, a lot of hands went up. A lot of hands didn't go up. See, that's just it. And, and we're about 60-40, uh, maybe 45-55 split. And the minority loves the, the greeting time. Now, if you just raised your hand and you said, I love the stand and greet time. By the way, the stand and greet in every service that love it right here. Uh -huh. They're in the front, right here. They just are like, yeah, we, get, we just I love this. But the majority are right here and right on this. So here's the thing. If you just raised your hand, then I want you to see Pastor Chet right after the service, and I want you to volunteer to be on the First Impressions team. Look what because we done. want the people who are, are excited about greeting people to be the greeters. Can you imagine that? Now, here's the thing. 
And, and, and just hear my heart on this. Uh, the reason that guests didn't like the stand and greet time is because they thought it was fake. You're only nice to me because the guy up front is telling you you have to be nice to me now. Go be friendly now. Do it. <laughs> See, and, and that doesn't seem real. doesn't seem genuine. And so I want us to be genuinely friendly without being prompted by the authority figures that are up on stage with microphones. And so here's the deal. When you come in and sit down, look around you. Greet the people around you. Say hi. If you don't know their name, introduce yourself. If, if they are new to Calvary, invite them to lunch. Take them with you. Invite them to your life group. Invite them to what, you know, in other words, include them. Don't just go, I wish they'd move over because I don't know them. You see, I want us to be the people who are welcoming and friendly without an official designated time to be welcoming and friendly. And that, that's really my heart's desire. And if you just can't stand it and you got to greet people, then sign up and do it officially because we need you. You see, we want to be that place that expresses to others that Jesus cares for you. And we want you to know that Jesus offers hope. Now, this is a story about hope. There are ten men who are absolutely hopeless, lepers, outcasts. They have no future ahead of them, and Jesus gives them their life back. He, he heals them, and, and now they can return home. They can return to their livelihood. They can take care of their families. They can be in their community. They can go to worship the living God. See, Jesus offers us hope. And one of the ways he offers us hope is Jesus offers us hope for healing. In other words, if you're sick, if you don't feel good, kids, if you get sick and you're not feeling good, or if someone you care about is sick and not feeling good, then you can pray for them. It is always right to ask God to heal because sometimes God heals us. Sometimes he does it miraculously, and we are not feeling good, and we pray and ask the God to heal, and he heals us. And sometimes God does it through doctors and medicine. And kids, sometimes God does it through needles. Any of you kids like needles? Ugh. Any of you kids hate needles? Yeah, me too. Now, any of you adults hate needles? Yeah, thank you. For, can, see, and, and, and yet God uses those things to heal. And sometimes God doesn't heal us. Sometimes we ask him to heal, and he doesn't heal us, and we need to understand why. Because all the healing that happens in this world, in this lifetime, is just temporary. It's just short term. It's not going to last. And, and see, our hope is the fact that one day God's going to heal us perfectly, and he's gonna, when we go to heaven, we're going to get new bodies, and those bodies will never get old. And they'll never hurt, and they'll never get sick, and they'll never die, and I'm praying they never get fat. <laughs> Is anybody else with me on that one? Yeah. See, that way I, I, I can either one of two things is going to happen. Plan A is that way I can eat all the chocolate ice cream I want. Plan B is that it's heaven, and so the broccoli will taste like chocolate ice cream. <laughs> That's just my theory. That would be nice. So anyway, Jesus offers hope. He offers hope for healing, and he offers hope for? Help. I need somebody. Help. Not just anybody. You need Jesus. I do. I need a lot of Jesus. Let me tell you a little bit about how much I need him. A few months ago, my family was having just one of those days that we actually have a lot. Does anyone ever have one of those days? Okay, maybe you can relate to this. Wake up late, get the kids to school late. You and your husband both lock your keys in your car. Yeah, real deal, yeah? You mess up at work. Uh, you forget appointments or you can't get there because you don't have a car. It was bad news. Well, by the end of the day, we got our kids to bed. And um, before we go to sleep, Brandon usually leads our, our family in a prayer. And this is how our prayer went that night. Dear Jesus. Then he paused, and I thought he was going to start bawling. And I'm like, oh, please keep it together, honey. Keep it together. And he just went, Help! <laughs> at the top of his lungs, and we started laughing so hard because <laughs> there was nothing else to do at that point. Have you ever been there where you just have to lift it up and like, help me? There's no other words. We all need that help, and Jesus offers us help in so many different ways, and one of them is through his scripture, through the Bible, through his word. He gives us instructions for our life, how to live a blessed life, how to make it better if you messed up how he forgives us and shows us grace and how we can show that same forgiveness and grace to others. He gives that to us and sometimes we forget about it. 
Well, it becomes extra powerful when you start memorizing those words that he's given us, the sword of the spirit. You use it to fight the lies and the things that people tell you that aren't true. And today, we're going to do a little something a little fun. Don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you or make you do something uncomfortable. But I need everybody to loosen up. Okay, loosen it up. We're going to memorize a verse today, Psalm 46, 1. And it comes from the NIRV version that we use for the children in our children's ministry here. So it might sound a little different to some of you that go by a different version. But first, let's read through this scripture all together. And now we're going to put it to some motions. That's why we're loosening up. Okay, let's read it together. God, God is, our is our place, place of, of safety. safety. He, he gives, gives us strength. strength. He is, is always, always there, there to, to help, help us in, in times, times of trouble. trouble. Okay, Psalm 46, so, one. Psalm 46 one. Yeah, Thank you. 46. Okay, this group right here, you guys see me? Right here. You guys are going to be in charge of the first line, which is God is our place of safety. And this is your motion. You ready? God. Before I try it again. God. There we are. Is our place of safety. Try it one more time. God is our place of safety. Good job. Let's go to this middle section. Okay. You guys are going to say, he, he gives, gives us, us strength. strength. Oh, I like the roundness that you added to it, Joey. We're <laughs> going to do that. He, he gives, gives us, us strength. strength. Very good. Now we're going to start over. And you guys can say it with us too. Ready? God, God is, is our, our place of safety. safety. He, he gives us strength. strength. Now the last chunk over here, you guys are going to say, he is always there. Try it. He, he is, is always, always there, there to help, help us, us in times, times of trouble. trouble. To help, help us, us in times, times of trouble. trouble. I think we've got it. So we're going to do it all together. And I'm going to have you stand up just to loosen up. And we have a lot of children in here. And they need some energy. Okay, you guys ready? Stand up. Loosen it up. We're going to do it as loud as we can and as fast as we can. Here we go. God is our place of safety. He gives us strength. He is always there to help us in times of trouble. And everybody, Psalm 46, 1. Very good. You can take a seat. I really like putting motions to memory verses because it helps me remember, and I hope that it helped you today. Speaking of memory verses, this, um, the last month in Calvary Kids, we have been trying to memorize a verse, Ephesians 2, 8. And I'm going to have Joey say it for us with Miss Nomi. Everybody listen up. God's grace has saved you because of your faith in Christ. Anything you do, from anything you do, it is God's gift, Ephesians 2, 8. Very good. Yay. Ephesians 2.8 tells us that our salvation doesn't come from anything you do. Did you hear that? Your salvation doesn't come from anything you do. It is God's gift. It's by his grace because none of us are good enough and none of us can do enough to be good enough. That's true. So um, another way that Jesus helps us and offers us hope is by his salvation. Yeah. Jesus offers us the hope of salvation. In fact, Jesus is our only hope for salvation. Because apart from him, we have no expectation of eternal life. We have no uh, adoption as sons and daughters of the living God. And so it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that we have that expectation of life eternal. And so if you are a follower of Jesus, and by that I mean if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you have that reality that you belong to God, and nothing is ever going to separate you from him, and that when you leave this world, you're going to be in heaven with Jesus forever. Now, here's the thing. We want everyone to leave here today with that expectation, with that hope that Jesus is their Savior and they have eternal life. And if you haven't made that commitment yet, if you haven't made that decision to follow Jesus with your life, don't leave here today without talking to someone. Our prayer team will be here at the front after the service. There'll be pastors at both the Connection Centers. We would love to talk with you about how you can have that relationship with Jesus. But families, here's what we'd really love. Parents, we'd love for you to ask your sons, your daughters, hey, have you come to that place where you're ready to make that decision to follow Jesus? Now, I don't want you to push them. 
I don't want you to, to, you know, try to put an expectation on it, but go ahead and have that conversation with your kids. We want you to lead your family. Can I jump in there for a of second? Course. I get these questions a lot asking if we um, pray the salvation prayer with our children and Calvary kids. And um, we actually, <clears throat> we don't. Let me explain. We are here to help and to teach and to encourage and to motivate your children. You are there to lead. You have that special relationship with them. You know their maturity level. And you know when they're ready. And we don't always. Um, there are times that, yes, we absolutely do. And there are times where we pray with you if you are not sure how to pray. Um, but please take us seriously when, when I say we are here to help you and we are here to encourage you and, and we will always be here. But you are the leaders and we're here to cheer you on. So parents, have that conversation with your kids. But children, ask your moms and dads, hey, have you made that commitment to follow Jesus with your life? And if they say yes, then tell them about that. Share your story of how you came to that place where you said, hey, I'm going to trust Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus because it is a wonderful blessing for your kids to hear your story of how God changed your life. What a great way to gift that faith to them and to lead them into that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Because Jesus offers us hope. He offers us hope of healing, of help, and of course of salvation. Finally, uh, today in this story, we want you to see that God delights in our gratitude. This is a story about gratitude. Jesus affirms the one leper who came back. He, he delighted in him. He said, hey, uh, where are the other nine at? And you're here, and you're praising God, and you're giving thanks. This is an awesome thing. And God affirms us as his children when we are grateful. Now, uh, parents, uh, you know, whether your kids are little or, or they used to be little, uh, what did you do whenever somebody, you know, would compliment your child or give them a gift? What did you prompt your kids to say? Yeah, and, and uh, as they got older, didn't it irritate you a little bit more when you had to prompt them? So that, like, when they're teenagers, if you have to prompt them, it's more like, boom, on the back of the head, <laughs> right? Because you expect them, hey, you should be grateful by now. I've taught you better than this. And, and I wonder sometimes if our Heavenly Father doesn't feel that way about us a little bit because He delights in our gratitude. So I'm going to... Uh, make a statement that may cause you a little bit discomfort, and I hope it causes a lot of discussion in this coming week. If you're only thankful on the inside, you're not really grateful. If you're only thankful on the inside, you're not really grateful. Uh, how many lepers were there in the story? How many of those lepers got healed? Ten of them. How many of those ten lepers do you really think were excited that they were healed? Ten of them. Yeah, all of them were excited. They were healed. They got to go home to their families. It's awesome. How many of those lepers expressed gratitude? One. All of them were excited about the, you know, the fact that Jesus healed them, and, but they didn't express it to Jesus. They didn't, they didn't say, hey, thank you for doing this. They just took the, the blessing and went on their way. And if you are grateful then please express it with your words, express it with your actions, express it with your life, live out the gratitude. And I would also say be understanding of everyone's different thank you languages. Some people thank you with a card, some people thank you with a call. Um, I have a grandma that I absolutely have to send a thank you card to or else she won't be thanked, <laughs> even if I have a phone call. Just be understanding of different people's ways of thanking. Um, kids, raise your hand if you ate breakfast today. <laughs> Some of the parents are like, raise your hands. I fed you. Okay, now point to the person that made it for you or bought it for you. Can you thank them real quick? Yeah. Raise your hand if um, someone else made you your breakfast today, like a husband, wife, and point to the person that made it for you and thank them. When's the last time you thanked your mailman? Your dentist, firefighters, police officers. When is the last time you thanked a teacher? You have a moment right now if you see some of them. We always need to take those moments and remember not to take them for granted, but to be thankful for our teachers, our, our, our leaders, those around us every day that help. 
See, not only do we want the kids to say thank you to mom and dad for doing all the things that they do for you, but parents, I want to challenge you to, to, well, do you ever say thanks to your kids? I mean, if you expect them to do chores, to help with dinner, to do their homework, to basically be a good kid, and they do that, are you expressing gratitude to them, for them, for the things that they're doing? Or do you just simply go, well, I expect my kids to do better than I did at every single level? In other words, sometimes we as parents, we raise the bar of expectation on our kids, and we forget that they need to hear gratitude from us as well. Are we saying thanks when they do a good job? You know, uh, when, when they're staying out of trouble, when they're giving their best? Uh, you know, or do we just simply go, well, you know, it's not good enough? See, if you express gratitude to your kids, it's going to build them up. It's going to encourage them. Here's what the Apostle Paul said, and, and it's words that all of us need to hear out of 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray continually, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you who are in Christ Jesus. So if our kids are going to grow up to be great, grateful people, they're going to see that and hear that from us as their parents. So parents, uh, let's be thankful, which doesn't just mean you're, you thank your kids, but thank the people around you in life. Be grateful. Now, uh, the next uncomfortable question. Are you more grateful for God or for his gifts? Are you more grateful for God or for his gift? See, nine out of the ten lepers were thankful for the gift, right? They're excited. They got healed. They ran to show themselves to the priest. They got their life back. Jesus is awesome, but they didn't express gratitude to him. One leper went back to Jesus and said, Jesus, I value you. I want to come to you face to face to you and say thank you and tell you how you have changed my life and tell you that I love you and tell you I appreciate you to him. I'm not sure that those nine weren't just more thankful for the gift rather than for the giver of the gift. Uh, so here's a, here's a conversation you can have over lunch. What's the worst gift you've ever been given? What's the worst gift you've ever been given? Julie, what's the worst gift you've ever been given? Cleaning products. I hope it wasn't Brandon who gave them to you. <laughs> no, he would never do such a thing. Uh, see, uh, <laughs> probably a mother-in-law. What uh, about anyway. you? <laughs> Worst gift I've ever been given, uh, and this will make some people laugh, was a good friend of mine uh, gave us a gift card to Pottery Barn. How and is that a bad thing? But, okay, they don't even sell any food at Pottery Barn. <laughs> do I look like a Pottery Barn kind of person? <laughs> No. I mean, honestly, really, and this is a friend of mine who's known me since I was in junior high school, and he gave us a gift. For, I'm sure it was a good intent because our anniversary, he probably assumed Morelda would use it, but you guys notice there's not a pottery barn within 150 miles a year. And, and, uh, and yes, that was, yeah, I could have done online, online shopping. shopping, but they didn't really have that back in the dark ages. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a recent advent, and uh, I, you know, and here's the thing. My friend who gave it to me, his childhood friend, love him. He is such a great guy, and I really didn't care that he gave me a, a gift that, that wasn't a great gift. Because I care about him, and I love him, and I know his heart, and I know that he cares for me, and so, you know, I either let that, is the only gift card I haven't used, or maybe I re-gifted it, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> oh, maybe come on, you guys it? do that too. <laughs> but here's the thing. This is how this applies to our lives. So many times, we get desperate for God. Our life gets broken. We get in a mess. We get in a jam. We're hurting. And we call out to God and we pray and we come to church uh, just, you know, every time the doors are open and we ask people to pray for us. We ask pastors to pray for us. And guess what? God answers our prayer and he heals us and he delivers us and he fixes the problem and he redeems our situation. And we are so thankful that we stop coming to church as much. Our life is back together and we kind of drift away from God and we don't ask people to pray for us and we're not praying as much. And... If we do that, it's indicative that maybe, just maybe, we value the gift more than we value the giver. And that's something that we need to struggle with. Because we want each and every individual to practice gratitude. And we want our families to practice gratitude out loud, being thankful. 
everyone received a bulletin today if you didn't grab one on your way out because there is a half piece of paper, a half sheet of, half sheet of paper that has a five days of gratitude assignment on it. We're going to be encouraging you with this over Facebook. <clears throat> but every day this week it gives you either an activity or a discussion to have with your family, whether they're family here or far, over the phone. But we encourage you to put this into practice this week and, and practice that gratitude. And everybody can use that. Whether you have little ones at home or not, whether it's just a husband or wife, Again, we want you to practice gratitude because we know that as you express gratitude to God and to others, your life is going to get better. Remember today, Jesus cares for you always and forever. Jesus offers you hope no matter what situation you're in. And God delights in our gratitude. So we want each and every person here to be a delightful child to God without being prompted. Let's pray.